you know, th this show is called The Breakup and it's all about relationships with money. And right now sitting in Barbados, it's like looking at your crazy ex or something and they're not doing great. And you're like checking them out on social media and their life is kind of like falling apart, right? So that's, that's what it's like as a Canadian looking into uh, from abroad, the craziness of over there. And it's not really a laughing matter. There's some scary, scary stuff, but, but still let's put it in context and that's what we're gonna break down today. So I wanna start today with a story that was a few days old, but I think is important for what we're dealing with today. And that's the Charlie Munger story. So if you don't know who Charlie Munger is, he's uh, one of the richest people in the world, I guess. He's close with Warren Buffett and they've been working together for a long, long time, made a ton of money. And Charlie Munger did a long interview on, I think at CNBC or one of these financial shows of the day. And he did something pretty amazing. He at once isolated one of the great existential threats to democracy, to the modern nation state, to what's going on in the world, and that's inflation. And he was serious about it. In no uncertain terms, he said, this is what destroys civilizations. And he mentioned Rome. So he objectively saw this huge problem on the horizon. And, and whenever you have a huge problem, you got to solve it, right? So you have this desire to solve a major problem. And then he went on to talk about how Bitcoin itself was sort of viral. And he used a different word, but he meant viral, right? It has this mimetic quality that we all know, right? Bitcoin can be communicated through images, through really packed, dense information. That's what makes it, what makes memes such a big part of the culture. So he definitely saw that. Charlie Munger definitely saw that. But I want to put two thoughts together here and, and show what Charlie Munger actually did for us. So if you do notice a huge problem, civilizational problem, and you have an appetite to solve it, you have a certain hunger, let's say, like a hunger, right? But if you're also staring at the answer to that problem, right, and you miss it, and you miss it, I say we call that a munger, right? Missing the hunger for the big problem you want to solve, right? So, so Charlie Munger, Right. And it was kind of like, I don't want to make fun of people's looks or anything, but he's had those, you know, he's got really thick glasses and his eyes are kind of googly inside a bit. Right. This isn't I'm not trying to make fun of him, but it was really hard to watch him there searching for the answer that was right in front of him. And when you think about this show, it's about relationships. It was kind of like a rom com. You know, you're looking at this person, you're saying the person who loves you is right in front of you. Just look, just open your eyes. It's right there. Right. That's kind of what Charlie Munger did to me the other day. So. I say we all call that now the B21 variant. When you're just before understanding the importance of Bitcoin, it's right in front of your eyes. You know the problems in the world. You know that these solutions can, can get you there, but you just can't see it. That's the B21 monger variant. And it's spreading. It is spreading. The biggest spread, oh, one more point on that. The last time his partner accurately also called Bitcoin, not in this case VD, not the viral nature of Bitcoin passing and all that, but he called it, so Buffett called it rat poison once. And I actually was kicked off of CNN, I think. I, I went on CNN when that came out and I said, you know, Richard Quest was interviewing me on CNN. I said, Richard, they're right, it is rat poison. And Richard looked at me and said, put some birds here. Said, what are you talking about? What are you, he's all confused. And I said, oh, oh, oh you didn't know that the banks were the rats. And that was the last time they invited me on CNN, the buggers. I thought it was a good answer, right? Go look for that. They don't put that out there. That, that was suppressed, I say. Suppressed. No one heard about it. So now with the Munger variant spreading, we see that Trudeau is an absolute super spreader, like a super spreader of the Munger variant. B21 is on the loose throughout Canada. I mean, on the loose, right? I got parrots here. They're upset about something. I don't know what their problem is. Let me throw something at them. Get out of here. So the B21 variant on the run. And the frame I want to use today to describe how it's spreading so quickly is really Newton's third law. That's the point of this show, right? Contrast, right? We contrast fiat standard and the Bitcoin standard. But contrast in general works better to persuade people than... Uh, arguments or, you know, putting a really, a really tight piece of logic together or litigating something as a lawyer might, right? So contrast really helps provide uh, a lot of instruction. And that's how the B21 variant is spreading throughout Canada so well. So let's have a look now at, at some of these, you know, super spreader events that Trudeau has caused in the past few days, because some of them are amazing. First up, 
so, so if you don't know Newton's third law, let me just preface it. It's equal and opposite reaction, right? So, so the contrast is created by one action happening, and then the reaction to that creates that contrast, right? So action, reaction. So what happened with, with the emergency powers invocation? It wasn't quite as simple as some people thought. It created a whole series of action reactions, right? So the first that I wanna talk about, and this one's really important, right? This goes to the news, right? So, so the reaction to the news here helps Bitcoin for these reasons. Now, in general, the news, one of the things about it is that it, it, it flows in echo chambers, both in conservative politics and in liberal politics, right? So you've got a whole portion of it that um, in, in the case of conservative politics might only watch Fox News, might only watch online news. In the case of liberal folks, they might only be on CNN, MSNBC, and all these other things. And what happens is information doesn't pass over, but when it does, it can ricochet with great effect. And we saw the other day Ilhan Omar, a uh, absolutely liberal Democrat, maybe socialist. I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in her mouth about how she would identify herself. But she came out and tweeted the other day concerning a journalist in Canada. So this journalist, Alison Ma, works for the Ottawa Citizen, which is a newspaper in Ottawa. Not so important. Might have been a, you know 50 years ago, but it's on life support. Trudeau actually pays to keep it open. Most Canadian media is actually on life support. Trudeau pays for it to stay open. Otherwise, it would have closed years ago. A lot of these uh, newspapers, all of that would have been gone a long time ago. So Alison Ma, writing for the Ottawa Citizen, writes, the owner of a gelato shop in Ottawa says she regrets making her $250 donation to the truck convoy, saying she thought it was a peaceful grassroots movement. The uh, Ottawa Citizen Journalist then corrects um, that the uh, cafe owner had known about the troubles in Ottawa for days and it had been declared dangerous by the time she, she even gave the donation. So the journalist is sort of doubting the story of this uh, small gelato owner and, and then tweeted both the story from the citizen and her take on it. And Ilhan Omar comes out and says, I fail to see why any journalist felt the need to report on a shop owner making such an insignificant donation rather than to get them harassed. It's unconscionable and journalists should know better. And she mentions in there that this was a grassroots donation in the tweet thread that she had. One of the most amazing things that I saw instantly when I went to Ilhan Omar's own Twitter bio is you see that she's grassroots funded. Right, so she's talking about grassroots donations and she's protecting really her own network, right? She gets it, right? She gets it. I don't know about the Bitcoin piece, but she's got a strong case of B21 as far as I'm concerned. She's got some Munger virus right there. And so she noticed this, right? And one of the most amazing things that that did to me personally, right? That they did to me personally, I can remember all those years ago when you know, some liberals would say, oh, terrorism is just a label. And I would say, no, we know what terrorism are, is, right? It's about the jihad and all these things, right? Well, I was wrong, right? I, I could have had that argument with Ilhan Omar 10 years ago, a year ago, I was that wrong still, right? Now it turns out, I look at my own country and I see the a police chief of Ottawa having a press conference. They got a new one because they fired the old one because he wouldn't do the, the damage, you know, to, to, to kick the protesters out of the city. And he says right in there, we're going to sanction individuals. And this guy, I'm telling you, he's from, you know, fascism, central casting. Like he's, you know, skinhead. Uh, this guy looks mean, man. Like if I was casting, a, you know, some kind of a, a fascist in a role, I'm telling you, uh, no casting agent can get me a better guy than that. So he's there telling me that individual are sanctioned. I don't know if I'm sanctioned. I probably am, but I guess I'm a terrorist now. So whatever argument I'd have had with Ilhan Omar 10 years ago about the Patriot Act, I was wrong, right? So when you break the box like that, when you, when you shatter the normal echo chambers that are there, you do a lot of damage in this case, right? I changed my mind. I have a, a whole new concept around this stuff, right? Ilhan Omar was right about that. I was wrong for 20 years. Right. And and now I understand it. Now I see it. Now I see how it can be twisted. I was completely wrong. And and what we have here is actually a huge discrediting of the news in the end. The damage that's inflicted by one person like Ilhan Omar, who's behind the lines in the echo chamber, who says something, it echoes in there and does a tremendous amount of damage. 
if you look at the court system in Canada, I don't even, like I said, I don't know if I'm a terrorist. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I can't go back. Like someone said, when are you going to come back to Canada? I said, well, uh, I mean, there's no rule of law anymore. So I, I don't think I can just go there. <laughs> like I kind of talk about Bitcoin a lot and people know, right? But luckily people like me kind of saw this coming, right? So we are here. This is a situation where I have the space and time to see it as like I said, a, a relationship and a partner that I used to have that's not doing so well. And I, I get to see it on social media, right? So that's what's going on there. So um, so the police chief comes out and says he's going to do this stuff. We see all these images now of the Mounties, right? One of the things that Canadians prided themselves on. Do you know, what, do you know where, where that comes in the Canadian folklore and the mythology and all of that stuff? So there was a Wild West in America. There was no Wild West in Canada, yet it was pioneered. It was pioneered with diplomacy, with skill, right? And a lot of people say it was the Mounties who brought that skill. Maybe that's what we were taught in school. I have no idea anymore. History is probably as fake as the news, right? We don't know. So what I know is that we were taught that. Now we see what the Mounties did to people in the stampede that happened with some of the protesters, right? There was some blood, there was some damage, there was some horses trampling people. I don't know all the details. I don't know the details of what happened. I saw a lot of the video, I have a pretty good idea, but how can the Mounties ever come back from this? I mean, this is a huge blow. There's other blows to the Mounties, but this one was international, right? This is different than what was going on internally. And internally, it was already a meat grinder in there. It was already a kill box as far as, you know, they, they said for years, there was a lot of Me Too stuff that hit that place, probably all valid, right? But now it's all gonna come to the surface again. So there's another institution upon which the country was built that doesn't quite have the, the, the cachet it once had, right? We don't think of it the same way. Canada in general as a legal system now, what do counterparties think? What do financial people who have dealings with Canada think, right? They can't predict where they sit in law. And that's a major problem, right? A major, major problem. You can even see it with, you know, one of the things at the protest that was really remarkable was the amount of national anthem singing, right? Canadians were singing the anthem every time something would happen. They would sing the anthem. They would go, oh, Canada, and they would go on and on. Well, simultaneous to all these protests was the Olympic Games, the time when Canadians would normally come together, sing the anthem. I was at the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver that were hosted in Canada. And we sang the anthem at a heartbeat. It was, it, was, it was a national news story that Canadians were acting so American in the rah-rah nationalism and singing their anthem everywhere, right? So they did it again here. But what I heard was almost like the anthem at a funeral, like it's dying, like, you're, like it's a soliloquy for the end of something that was you loved and was important. It fits into my breakup you know, frame that I use on the show. I, I couldn't help but hear it that way. I, I heard it as, as a lament right? A lament for Canada when people would sing it. I didn't hear rah, rah, nationalism. And when I go look at the Olympics going on right now, here's the thing that, that I saw early about Canada and why I think Canada is at the forefront of this World War III thing, right? Canada, one-tenth the population of the United States, but much more credentialed, right? Much more credentialed. We sort of have one of every one of the American think tanks, right? We've got our Sierra Club. We've got our, I mean, it was invented, Greenpeace was invented in Canada. And it's on the right too, right? So you've got all of these special interest groups, almost as many as the United States. I'd say, I'm sure the United States has way more, but, but per capita, I'd say we have more in Canada. And what ended up happening was Canadians were sort of the victims of all this messaging, all these psyops, all of these arguments from all of these super educated people fighting over power and control and, and everything that went on in Canada. But because the country was a little smaller, a little more concentrated, the people were maybe victim to it a little more, right? So you end up getting perverted things like this. You get the, the, this whole story about the anthem and the Olympics that I mentioned, the Olympics going on right now. And you've got a guy like Dick Pound, great name. I've met him many times, Dick Pound. Dick Pound went to uh, law school in Canada, was an Olympic swimmer. And then he was the guy who negotiated the big TV deal for NBC in the United States for the Olympics in Los Angeles and then in Seoul. And that's what really skyrocketed the Olympic Games in American consciousness. He, he delivered this huge TV deal. He would have been the new chancellor of the IOC had he not been in charge of the investigation into the Salt Lake City corruption. The same reason why Mitt Romney came and ran the Olympics after. So he investigated that and apparently made too many enemies. So they put that 
Belgian sailor in charge of it. Jacques Roga is his name, right? He took over after. Dick Pan was supposed to do it. He ended up getting WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, which is in my home city. So they do all the doping for all the medical stuff, right? But here's the interesting part. Here's that medical piece, right? The medical, whatever you want to call it, medical state piece, right? <clears throat> He's been one of the main liaisons between the IOC and China when it comes to uh, Peng Shui, the female tennis player who we don't know if she's kidnapped, no one knows what's going on. He says she's fine, right? Dick Pound says she's fine. Maybe. I bring up all the story about Dick Pound just to show you that here's someone who's the chancellor of McGill University, the highest, I mean, it's like Harvard, running a major international organization, right? Supposed to be on top of uh, medical business when it comes to anti-doping, right? That's a major medical field telling you that China was right, right? This girl is okay, wasn't raped. Don't even look there. She seems fine to me, he said. She seems fine to me. That was his exact quote, right? So Canada's been living with people like this. We don't know where he's coming from. There's a, there's a whole transparency problem there, right? A whole transparency problem there. And, and that's what we're going to see fixed. You see the opposite to that right now in the United States. There's all these people who are all upset that there's an American person who is being nominated to uh, the uh, directorship of nuclear energy waste management. And it turns out that this person has some kink. This person is into, uh, they are into, I, I don't want to make a gendering mistake, they are into um, some sadomaso stuff. I don't know exactly what's going on. Some clothing stuff. Um, anyway, that's not the point. The point is people are offended. Apparently it's going to be a big thing for Russia over America because this person is embarrassing. But hold on. I look at Dick Pound and I say, I don't know anything about Dick Pound, right? Who is this guy? Why does he say there's, there's no uh, rape going on of this girl? Why, how does he know? Is they, he, he saw her on Zoom or something, right? So you get this guy who we don't know anything about him. So I don't think we're going to end or win the privacy debate necessarily, right? It looks like a lot of this stuff is coming towards us, right? What did you do? Where did you go? Access, all that kind of stuff, right? But transparency, I think, has to go in the other direction too, right? That's going to be part of the answer here. So we see this person right now and we see them as weird because they're trans or whatever and running a nuclear waste thing. I just want to know if they're processing nuclear waste because that means we're doing nuclear energy and that's all I care about. I think the, the, the pathway forward is going to be to know more about these people so that we don't care so much. Because if we knew as much about Dick Pound as we do about the managing director or the maybe a managing director of the nuclear waste stuff, I'm pretty sure Dick would have some fucked up shit about him. I'm pretty sure, right? Like, I don't, I don't know, but he's an Olympic swimmer. He's got all this power and made a bunch of money for all kinds of people, NBC included. And he seems to know what's going on in China about sex trafficking. So I don't know. Let's see. Let's see, right? Let's find out more about Dick Pound. Before we have to tell him stuff, we should find out more about him, right? So that's Dick Pound. Now, what we can see with this sort of equal and opposite reaction here, right, is, is we don't know about the law, not good for Canada, really bad for its reputation, right? We don't know about the news, right? That, that, that's, I think, what Ilan Omar did. She, she would have created doubt in the minds of people within that echo chamber about whether or not the news is telling them the truth, which is already trending in Canada. It's already happening, now, right? So the reputation with the Mounties, no good, right? This is all pushing the country and its reputation down into the ground, right? Really important stuff. Then we get Majid Nawaz today, Spotify, Joe Rogan. All stories go through Joe Rogan on this story, on this show, right? We always say that. So we've got to have our mandatory Joe Rogan mentioned today. So apparently the episode of Joe Rogan that dropped today is very difficult to access on Spotify. It's being suppressed. Apparently it was recorded quite a while ago. And Majid, who I followed for a long time, he's a London Islamic leftist but really clever, really saw through a lot of lies and was one of the first pro-Trump people that I would qualify on the left. So that's one reason why I saw him as a really interesting voice. He seemed to be carving out such a unique space back in 2015 and 2016 when this stuff was crazy. So I've been following him since then. So Majid now does an episode on Joe Rogan, which dropped today, all about, all about Canada and CBDCs. 
and what the medical industry and big pharma wants out of banking. And that's what we saw in Canada, right? They deputized, 100% deputized the banking sector to be law enforcement. Canadians banking sector, in order to deal with these folks, became deputized by law enforcement. So when the chief of police in Ottawa says we're going to sanction individuals, maybe like me, right? Once again, we see exactly what uh, the book, The Sovereign Individual predicted, right? It predicted that countries would treat individuals the way bin Laden was treated, right? They would sanction individuals the way you would sanction countries. We hear about all the sanctioning of Russia, right? Well, now they're going to sanction individual Canadians for small amounts, right? And Majid Nawaz, his podcast on Joe Rogan today was all about that. It was all about the infrastructure of vaccine passports and how CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, are the technology waiting to deploy all this stuff, right? So, so listen to the Majid. I haven't listened to the whole thing yet, but I'm told it's excellent. And I just like that it's been suppressed and uh, what's going on, you know, there must be something good in it, right? So, so far, so good. CBDC stuff was tight. He explained it really, really well. Um, now, our last story, besides the sort of, you know, I guess that's it. When you see all of this sort of flaccid behavior, right? What we're talking about here are psychology engines, right? The things that perpetuate economies forward. When we see this kind of flaccid, am I a terrorist? We don't know, I don't know. Can I go to Canada? I don't know, nobody knows, right? Is my friend a terrorist? I don't know. Are my children who are American terrorists? I don't know. They have a Bitcoin wallet, right? Uh, how far do they go? They said they'd go to families. Maybe they're terrorists. They're not even Canadian, right? I'll never get them Canadian citizenship. Why would I do that, right? So, so you get this really flaccid behavior. And what's more repelling than flaccid? It's not attractive, right? If you're in a relationship, if you're, if you're perpetuating something forward, flaccid behavior doesn't really do it, right? You're not going to get much. So we see this kind of flaccid behavior. And then we look at the Canadian dollar right, the Canadian dollar. So one of the pillars of Canada was this trustworthy, bedrock, conservative banking system. It's literally the foundation of the country, right? Canada was almost a copy of American federalism, except they made banking federal in order to build infrastructure east-west across the country, namely the railroad. They weren't going to get financed by England, and they had to beat the private interests of the United States after the Civil War that were building north-south up into Canada to extract resources. Canada had British Columbia on the Pacific Ocean, and it had Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces, and it needed to link them east-west before north-south interests came. England had one look at America after the Civil War and said, we're not fighting them again. Forget it. Like, these guys are machine guns now. They're crazy, right? They're on their own, Canada. Forget it. Get eaten or whatever. We're not paying for shit. And so the Canadians at the time were benefiting from uh, an America that was basically nobody home. The president after Lincoln was not that powerful. Uh, no one was really paying attention and they just wanted no war, no government. Let's build the country. So Canada operated in that little space and was able to build its railroad, but it had to federalize its banks in order to get, that was the reason to build the country, to make federal banking and be able to finance this cross-continental railroad. And so that's always been a really important part of the country. And, and that committee that I worked on, the Senate Banking Committee, is the original parliamentary committee in Canada. It's the oldest committee. It's the reason they built parliament. They wanted that committee to finance the railroad, first order of business. And, and so, you know, they, 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 this was something that Canada has been able to build from for generations, for generations. But when we're talking about Newton's third law, equal and opposite reaction, I don't know if everyone knew how drastic they went in one direction and, and what it can reverberate as. And when I look at it again, you know, we've got the governor of the Bank of Canada right now. This is kind of a simple man, right? He's kind of a simple guy. I've met him a few times. He was the governor under Mark Carney before. And then he went and became the Rotman Business School Chancellor or Chair or whatever. It's the big business, it's like Harvard Business School in Canada. And back then I said, hey, let's do a Bitcoin thing. He said, ah, no, no thanks. I'm going to do a blockchain technology thing with Don Tapscott. Don Tapscott's a nice guy, right? But he was not, he did not see the field. Just the other day, he's in an interview with a mainstream media journalist, mainstream media right? Not a, not a Bitcoin journalist. He did an interview with a mainstream media journalist who said, what do you think about all this Bitcoin and crypto stuff? 
And the governor of the Bank of Canada says, oh, they only use it for speculation. Ah, right? And the journal, mainstream media journalists, not a genius either, right? Mm -hmm. Says, mm, that's not exactly true. I see them doing a lot of stuff here, like energy and all that's happening, right? And that one question flustered the guy. I mean, he couldn't answer it. He stuttered, looked like a simple fool, right? Sorry, he looked like a simple guy. So this is the fella, right? This is the fella who probably did not predict there'd be anything like an Emergency Measures Act going into the banking sector in Canada, right? I don't think he imagined that. So now he's got to pick up the pieces. Is there full faith and credit still in the Canadian dollar? Isn't there some form of counterparty risk now that people aren't paying attention to, right? I continue to predict you're going to see it, especially in Bitcoin. Crypto people have a much better understanding of the risk of fiat currencies because they've seen so many uh, altcoins go to zero. We know what it looks like, right? People in crypto know what coins going to zero looks like. They're really trained. <laughs> they've seen it many times, right? And I can imagine you're going to start to see discount trade pairs for the Canadian dollar. I think you're going to see 4%, 5% rebates at exchanges in order to induce activity around Canadians who are definitely looking for a way out, right? Definitely looking for a way out. So there's this whole new vein of liquidity coming into, into Bitcoin. And, and I can see that money being dumped back on the foreign market. And if that happens, Newton's third law is going to get rip-roaring. And all of these forces combined in that Newtonian way send Bitcoin up. That's how I see it anyway. That's today's episode of The Breakout.